continuing from part two, this is part two A, Department of Homeland Security, all these people are in effect being paid by a foreign national entity which therefore violates the United States Constitution if a constitution was actually in existence. This is why no one within the Congress or the Senate or the DOJ or the Treasury, no matter what they do, whichever department, whether it's Mike Pompeo's lying and machinations and um, uh, Hillary Clinton with the Benghazi incidents, why none of these people are being prosecuted through what would be a conventional rule of law, because there isn't any. That's the deal, that they can't commit treason, they can't commit sedition, because there's no constitution. Your ex, these are all ex parte officers working for a foreign entity. So, to continue, what we've got therefore since 1945 and uh, the so-called winning the peace, Let's look at the control generally, planet-wise. If you want to look at, um, I think it's a guy called James Glattfelder, and it's from the Zurich Swiss Technical Institute, and what they showed with their modeling is that 147 countries, sorry, 147 companies are in effect controlling due to the interconnectivity at board level and um, uh, financial levels, um, they're all connected with each other and this, uh, these 147 countries are what's called the, the, the dominant core. There's a dominant core of a super entity. So this super entity are the people like um, the Starbucks and Amazon and Benetton and Nike and uh, all these other agencies like Barclays Bank and uh, uh, etc. So these 147 companies that control this super super dominant core are, are, are companies like, and I'll just read a couple off. Um, people like Barclays, Capital Group, FMR Group, AXA, State Street, JP Morgan, Legal and General, Vanguard. Now, a lot of these names that I'm mentioning here uh, will be very familiar to people who know about the so-called four largest hedge funds or five largest hedge funds in the world that virtually control everything. So whether it's Pepsi or whether it's Coca-Cola or whether it's... Uh, uh, it's Starbucks or it's Costa Coffee in the United Kingdom. They're all owned by these, these four or five, which are uh, BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, Berkshire Hathaway, and uh, Fidelity. So those five between them explain why when the global financial chokehold was put on all these businesses globally, from 19, uh, sorry, from uh, 2020, when the pandemic began, how come that none of these magnets of business, none of these uh, business owners, none of them were allowed to come forward and say, well, hang on a minute, I'm losing all the money that I've made in the last God knows how many years, um, and I, I don't agree with the fact. Can we maybe try some alternative measures or alternative ways? No, not at all. They were closed down and told to fall on their own swords because, as many of them said, if they wanted to look at other alternate ways, pressure was placed on them by the CEOs and also uh, organizations like um, uh, Larry Fink or Lawrence Fink and Hooley, who are on the, I think, Fink's on the board of trustees of the World Economic Forum. And so you don't think these these people could just do whatever they want whenever they wanted. They would either be pushed out of their positions or, uh, I don't know, uh, they would be relieved of their duty or would meet with untimely um, transitions to the, to the greater God in the sky. So this is what we've, we've got. These super entities and these corporations in pledge to these 
well, try a, a better pan to these so you can see it, these hedge funds. So where does this all tie in? It ties in with the fact that we're coming up to, I think we're at about 31, 31.48 trillion at the moment is the US national debt. 31.4 trillion which I suspect is a massive turning point and the reason I think it's a massive turning point on why the markets in 2023 are going to do nothing but go south is we've hit a trigger point we've hit pi pi 3.14 etc etc we've got that as on the debt clock we might have just passed it but we've got that now they'll either do that or we might end up taking the reciprocal which would be 3318 whoops as what's called a harmonic that's like a little note 3.18 so what we've got to ask is where's all this money gone it hasn't gone for you it hasn't got for new medical services or procedures it hasn't gone for better schooling it's gone into open-ended space projects open-ended medical budgets open-ended everything but you haven't got any of it and the reason they have to keep mounting it and keep pushing it is because they don't care and they are looking to further their agendas by for example mission impossible 7 as an example why would hollywood pay millions and millions and millions just to to, to capture um tom cruise parachuting off his motorbike as it goes off the edge of a cliff in norway what is the point of that why would they pay such sums and the reason they want to pay such sums is in part they want this footage so that when they extract you when they transfer you into the metaverse mr zuckerberg's metaverse that you'll be able to enjoy these holographic real virtual reality experiences just as you were there and that's the thing for those who doubt it look at um i think it's uh Series 6, Episode 6, Star Trek, Ship in a Bottle, of the potential power of holographic reality when it's wrapped around individuals. It's a bit like in the film of The Matrix, Neo says, do you think that's air you're breathing in here, Neo? It's part of the mind makes it real. So everything is to do with mind, and this is something we're going to cover in later videos because it's more powerful than, than anything, and... Uh, on we go so what we've got is and i've mentioned this uh prior but i'm going to clear it now because i've actually got the, the 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 details now what we're looking at is this treasurer incident here the treasurer is part of the office of monetary affairs so this is a separate arm or part of government and what we've got now is that the last uh, male treasurer I'm running out of room here so I'm going to see if I can write on the back the last so we're on side two now so this last male treasurer was a guy called William Alexander, what was his first surname? Julian. Now, the last treasurer, he was the treasurer up until 1949, and it was he who, with what was called Executive Order E O, I think it was 6102, six, he actually was the custodian of the confiscation of all the gold by the Federal Reserve following Bretton Woods and the Gold Confiscation Act. So he was the last individual that was, was part of that. Now, uh, he took custody of the gold on behalf of 
Okay, so he's now, he's the treasurer signing the fractional reserve notes. Not part of the secretary of the treasury, he's just the treasurer. And he died mysteriously, or he died in a, a, in a car crash, another one, in 1949. So we will not be able to find out any anecdotal evidence of, of what he was involved in, but that's too far, far down the, the, the road now. Now, since that point, we have had nothing but female treasurers. And what I like to do is just to read off very quickly uh, these treasurers. We started off, the first woman uh, was Georgia Knees Clark from 49 to 53 after him. Next, it was Romana Acosta, oh, sorry, after that it was Ivy Baker. Then it was Catherine Grahanam. Then it was Dorothy Elston up until 71, and then from 71, this was just around the time of the Nixon shock, when the gold standard, sorry, the gold exchange mechanism between the gold certificated United States dollars and the fractional reserve notes was disconnected, we had the following, Romana Acosta Buanelos. She was a deportee as a young child and allowed to come back into the United States. After that, Francine Irving Neffer, after that, Azzy Taylor Morton. She was a black lady from a, a, a Texas uh, called St. John's Colony. After that, we had Angela Maria Buchanan. Then we had Catherine Davalos Ortega. Then we had Catalina Vasquez Villalpondo. This was up to 93. Then we had Mary Ellen Withrow. I'm not sure she sounds, uh, um, it's an American. Then Rosario Marino. Then we have Anna Escobedo Cabral. Then we have Rosa Gumataito Rios, up to 2016. Then Jovita Carranza, Mexican. And the current one on the notes signing is Marilyn Robega Maleraba. She's an American tribal leader and chief of the Mohegan tribe. So, unless the Federal Reserve has just got a lovely, um, you know, uh, appreciation of alternative cultures and alternative individuals, you have to ask yourself why over 66%, nearly 70% of the treasurers, and all of them since 1949, are women or Hispanic of uh, of Mexican or, I uh, say, uh, Hispanic origin. So it's, it's food for thought. So 66% of the treasurer of the United States are Hispanic and Native American. Okay, so what we've got now, these female treasurers, As the situation therefore is that the treasurer is nothing to do with the secretary of the treasury, what they're acting in is an, an ex parte position. They're not part of the, they are not answerable to anyone. So the Office of Monetary Affairs is answerable to what's called the secretary. Secretary of monetary affairs. Now, next we have then a drum roll, because who do you think the Secretary of Monetary Affairs is? You would think he's something to do with the Treasury, you would think he was something to do with the Federal Reserve, but no. The drum roll, as it ends, points to the fact that he is actually the Secretary of State. So why is that important? Well, it shows that there is an agenda and a double entry of bookkeeping going on here because what's the Secretary of State supposedly looking after? He's supposed to be looking after, after affairs of the state of a domestic, uh, a domestic point of view 
Uh, for example, in the United Kingdom, the Secretary of State looks after home affairs. Um, and it's the same in the Commonwealth countries. So this is, that was a position that was formerly held by someone like Mike, uh, Mike Pompeo. But why it becomes important is, though the, the, the treasurer signs all the banknotes, we've got all those offices that I mentioned before, whether it's FBI and DOJ and Congress and the Senate, they're all being paid by notes signed by the Treasurer of the United States. And so what we've got is these, this, and I'm repeating myself slightly, it's the Treasurers here that are in effect uh, controlling the money supply for the entire, the entire government. And so you, you're nothing but pledged debt. So the rule of law doesn't exist anymore. This is why people like Roger Stone, whether it's Steve Bannon, whether it's General Sir Mike Flynn, why they can't get a fair hearing or there doesn't seem to be the ability. And in a nutshell, it means people like Newsom and Schiff and Feinstein, Maxine Waters, AOC and the gang, they are all being paid by a foreign entity. They're not subject to treason or charges of sedition because it's owned lock, stock and barrel by the IMF and the World Bank. It's in receivership and further proof of this tie-in here is something that is quite important because something called Interpol. Now Interpol, Interpol was founded in 1938 as an international police organization. But what we've got is the Attorney General of the United States is what's called a designated member of this. So that's the Attorney General And he's what's called uh, a permanent member. He's what's called a permanent member. But what we've also got is the Secretary of the Treasury also is an alternate member. an alternate permanent member. Why is that important? Secretary of the Treasury currently is Janet Yellen. The Attorney General of the United States is a permanent member and an alternative per permanent member of the Secretary, is the Secretary of the Treasury, who are members of Interpol. And I think it is, what that means is I think it's Article, either Article 21 and Article 30, of the Convention and the Constitution of Interpol state that when joining Interpol, in effect, what you are doing is you are have your first priority and first obligations to Interpol and are not to be at the behest of your, your originating state, department or country. So in effect, what it means is they've taken an oath of allegiance to another organization. It's a foreign body, it's a foreign organization, and they've taken an oath of allegiance. So this is why we have this problem. So the IMF, the IMF pays all United States marshals, all United States sheriffs, all United States lawyers, attorneys, judges, the Supreme Court, Congress, the Senate, and all those departments like the CIA, FBI, Etsy, the alphabet companies, country, sorry, alphabet organizations and agencies, which I've already covered and mentioned to you. So, is it any surprise that you feel that the representatives don't take any notice of you? And it's because they don't have to and will not, because since 1933, the bankruptcy, since then, 
the voluntary um, bankruptcy of the Allies, everyone is in the same pot and under one government. So the new world order isn't coming in further down the road, it's already in. And people need to wake up to, to this. So what you should go and look at is five United States Code, paragraph 782, item 17. And what it says specifically, and I'll read it to you, is the giving, loaning, or promising, or support, or money, or any other thing of value given for any purpose to any organization shall be conclusively presumed to constitute affiliation therewith. So, they are giving support, they're giving monetary value, they're giving their time and expertise to a foreign agency. So one cannot uh, serve two masters. That is a biblical quote, you can't serve God and mammon. Jesus himself said it, give unto Caesar what is Caesar, give unto God what is God's. And that's the, the nature of the deal. All of these people in your government, all these people in Australia, all the people from Rishi Sunak, um, who is the Prime Minister of England, who is one of the uh, former young global leaders who I missed off the list on the previous video. Um, they're all in the pay of this Zionist banking cartel, and it's those people that deliver the money, and therefore they decide who does what and with what to whom. So the, the US government is not paying any of these people, otherwise they, there would be evidence for an indictment for sedition or treason. And obviously there isn't because, as I've said before, and I keep repeating, there is no constitution. So all the court justices, are, all these, uh, and I'll just read here, my conclusion, uh, all allied countries from the US, the UK, all public servants, officials, congressmen, senators, in Westminster, or politicians elsewhere, all the judges, all the attorneys, all the law enforcement personnel, the Supreme Court justices, the states of countries and all their officials, they're all express agents of the foreign creditor principles who have bankrupted the United States, the United Kingdom, and the world, and the Commonwealth through the paper money banking swindle. So that's really, we've come up to the conclusion now, uh, a bankruptcy order, in effect, places you in a position as what's called ward of court, as a child or a minor or something that's being looked after. So the, the deceit and the criminality that's behind this is extensive and goes on a long time. What I'm going to show in the, the final video um, is what we can do to remedy it. Now, many people would say, in order to unpick this at this late hour, we need a miracle. Maybe we can deliver a miracle. Uh, part of the miracle is really knowing what's going on here. Uh, many people out there have done a lot more work than me in a lot more detail, but much of it is in books. Most people have got to try and get hold of the book. They've got to live it, learn it, digest it. And then what are you going to do with it? That's the thing. So what I understand is that there are a series of trusts in, uh, not only in progress, but inherently bedded in all the so-called constitutions of the, uh, of the world governments. And these ownership dockets um, have all got your name on it in part. Over the time, we've been welded in bit by bit like a stitch on a tapestry. One bit at a time as you were being born, you're entered onto the register and onto the roll. But as they've all been criminal, as they've all been fraudulent, as they've all been um, not revealed to you for the implications that they really have for you, then they are, um, they are what's called not fair and they're not equitable and they're not even. So with that in mind, we need to start to unpick them. And in the next video, what I'm going to do is put together some ideas whereby we can show how that can be done. Now, what it's going to mean is you start to act in groups. You're going to have to come together because one individual isn't going to be able to do it. Three, four, five of you together can have a greater purchase when you go in front of a judge. And what I'm going to get you to start doing is we're going to roll 
play this through by foreclosing on the creditor, so-called. The creditor is actually the debtor to you. Don't forget that. Yeah? They are masquerading as the creditor, but in effect, they are the debtor. And whoever is in charge of creating the security, the security that is handed over to the debt over the desk to the bank is the one who calls the tune. For example, let's look at any of you now who have been threatened with mortgage repossession. The moment it gets to the point where they have taken this and lodged a case in the court for uh, the repossession, and even if it's a credit card debt, what they're admitting immediately, let's use UCC for the benefit of, 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 of private, private commercial law. I know maybe people say, oh, this only applies to the United States, but it doesn't, it operates worldwide. What they're doing is they're actually coming along and confirming that they have in their possession of the note. They're admitting they have a security. If they have a security, they have a security interest. And if they have a security interest, there are specific obligations that they are obliged to undertake. Now, by the very fact that they have lodged a case in the court against you for repossession, what they've done is they've created the res. Yeah, look up that R-E-S. I'll put that there the res or thing a security of a trust. So there are four heads for the creation of a trust, identifiable objects, identifiable beneficiaries, you have to have a grantor, you have to have a trustee, and you have to have a thing that's put in. So if we can show quite easily that a trust has been created, then what we've got is we've turned the lights in the court from green for them into red. What we are going to show you is how to put those red lights there because everything is based on a presumption. And it's a presumption that you are a trustee and that you are going to be paying by signing and giving in the energy which is the bank notes, the promissory reserve notes from the Fed or the Bank of England or the Bank of France or Australia, whichever currency or the European Central Bank of which you use. And by the way, Christine Lagarde was also a member of the Global Young Leaders Initiative. Well, so we've got to then get to the point where we turn those traffic lights. And how we turn those traffic lights is we're going to create a role play by teaching you a prepared dialogue which will be sufficient to get you through the first hurdle. Hope I'm not giving too much away to the other side there, but I think it's the only way at this late time in the day, historically, where we can make any meaningful impact. So for any people out there in the United States who are interested in working with me um, in the UK, anywhere in Europe, what I would suggest is there is information that I have, which I don't want to reveal straight away on, on a public forum like this, but let's just say that in between or with myself, the people who work with me, wherever they are, um, the others, I believe we can crack this and make it so that we can undo not only the reset, we can, we can undo the best laid intentions of mice and men. And though their plans might be foolproof, and this is a bit of a giveaway here. I certainly don't believe that they're Godproof. So on that note, thank you for watching. Pass it on. Don't forget to have taken these notes. Study and research a little bit of what I've actually said there. But over and above that, um, make sure you're here and ready for the next one, which will be part three of The Trap. And that's how to get your head from out from under that trap that's sprung around it. Peter of England saying thank you for watching.